Hi. The second topic of this course is uh, data envelopment analysis, abbreviated as a DEA. The DEA method is uh, the most uh, traditional approach to efficiency analysis and also the most widely used, not only in operational research and management science field, but also in many, many applied areas of economics. So I will first uh, demonstrate to you the application of DEA using this uh, example of Finnish electricity distribution firms that I introduced in the uh, previous video. And then in the later lectures, I will, I will go into more detail to the theory and uh, mathematical formulations of DEA. So recall from the previous video le lesson, the cost frontier model used in the Finnish electric dis electricity distribution regulation. So in this model, we have a single input variable indicated by X. We have uh, three output variables indicated by Y. And we have also one uh, contextual variable indicated by Z. And then uh, we have both uh, inefficiency and noise indicated by symbols Y and V. And to be able to use the most basic formulations of DEA to estimating this kind of cost frontier model, we need to make some simplifying assumptions. So firstly, uh, we will strike out this uh, contextual variable Z from the model. It is well known in DEA that, uh, that uh, DEA doesn't handle very well this kind of uh, percentage variables, like here, this proportion of underground cables. We will return back to this question when we consider the contextual variables Z in more detail. And there is uh, simple approaches like two-stage DEA where this kind of Z variables could be returned back to. But perhaps a more serious uh, simplifying assumption here is that we need to assume away the random noise term V. And to this uh, issue, there is not really any, any good solutions available under the label of DEA. And uh, before proceeding, I want to also emphasize that this is really a big, uh, big, big assumption. Because in effect, if, you, if your data does include some, some uh, unobserved heterogeneity, omitted factors, uh, or just some, some uh, data errors, then all of those kind of factors will be effectively then attributed to this inefficiency term U. And it can also cause some bias in your, your uh, cost frontier model. So this is cost frontier C. So this is a very big assumption that we need to be aware of if, if we want to apply for apply DEA in practice. So taking this, uh, this kind of, uh, kind of model, then uh, to be able to use DEA, the user needs to make uh, certain specifications, which determine then the, the out, outcomes of the DEA model. Firstly, the user needs to specify the input and output variables. So inputs X, outputs Y. And uh, this we already did in the, on the previous slides. So again, we have a single input variable, which was the total cost. And then we have three output variables. In addition to those input and output variables, the user must uh, make some choice about the returns to scale. The two basic variants are the constant returns to scale and variable returns to scale formulations. I'll come to the meeting to, of meaning of that a little bit later. And then there exist also intermediate cases called non-increasing and non-decreasing returns to scale. Uh, in addition to the returns to scale, then the user must choose the orientation. The most classical uh, orientations are the input orientation and the output orientation. And we will also discuss those in more detail later. But to pave uh, some intuition, the input orientation is taking the output variables as given and is trying to decrease the input variables as much as possible. This is why I have indicated the input orientation in parentheses as a saving mode, because uh, 
in this uh, specific application, we are in, indeed uh, like trying to uh, save costs rather than expand outputs. The alternative of output orientation uh, would take the input variables as given and try to expand the outputs as much as possible. So this is why I have indicated in parentheses that this, this can be thought of as an expansion mode. Besides this uh, basic input and output orientation, of course, in the DEA literature, there exist a lot of um, other alternatives, including uh, non-radial efficiency measures, slack-based measures, and uh, so-called uh, directional distance function, which can be seen as a generalization of these input and output orientations. So we will come back to that question also later in this course. So when we run the DEA model to the, to the, to the empirical data, uh, we can get basically three types of information as a result. Uh, perhaps the main interest in, in a typical application is the efficiency scores. And DEA is very convenient in that it automatically generates uh, firm-specific efficiency scores for every unit in, the, in this uh, observed sample. But uh, besides those efficiency scores, uh, um, I would also recommend the users to have a look at the weights, because those weights are actually uh, critically important for determining those efficiency scores. And uh, DEA can generate two types of weights. Uh, the first ones are the multiplier weights, which I have indicated with the Greek uh, letter gamma. And these, these gamma weights are weights for the output variables. We have also another type of weights called intensity weights and indicated by the Greek letter lambda. So those lambda weights are then weights for, the, for those um, units in the, in the samples or, 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 or benchmarks. So... The basic idea is that these, these lambda weights are assigned, or they can be positive values for uh, the efficient units in the sample, which can be used then as role models for the, for the inefficient units. And the inefficient units are compared to those efficient ones, especially using these lambda weights. I'll discuss this in more detail in the, in the following. In the... Empirical example, um, I will utilize the material available in the, in the R tutorial prepared by my student assistant Sheng Dai. So you can find these uh, R tutorials for DEA and also the alternative method SFA uh, on, the, on the course website. And uh, if you are interested in applying DEA or, or SFA and some other formulations that are not available in the tutorial, uh, I have here also indicated a couple of references where you can find further information to, to move beyond these basic examples in this, in this uh, Sheng Dai's uh, uh, R tutorial. But again, the following examples are simply adopted from the Sheng Dai's uh, R tutorial. So firstly, let us consider the DEA efficiency scores and uh, in this first example, I have, I have uh, specified the constant returns to scale or CRS formulation. And I have also taken the input orientation, which is a very natural choice for this, uh, this uh, cost frontier application at hand. So on this slide, I have taken a, a simple extract from the, from this uh, R results. So I, I just uh, uh, illustrate the, by focusing on the first eight firms on the list. So notice that there are eight rows with these numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight indicated. So those numbers just refer to the first eight uh, uh, electricity distribution companies in the sample. Of course, there is a larger number of firms in the sample, but I just illustrate the results for the first eight units. And you can see there are two columns named F and FD. And uh, both columns give you the same, same results. So these F columns indicate the efficiency score for, for each unit. So for example, the first company would have the efficiency of uh, 0.756, or in percentage terms, it would be 
75.6% efficiency. In other words, that means that, uh, that uh, uh, DEA indicates that uh, the same outputs of the, of the firm number one could be, could be produced with using uh, only 75.6% of the, of the total cost compared to the actual observed cost. So in that sense, 25% of the cost could be, could be uh, eliminated by improving efficiency. That's the basic interpretation of the efficiency score in the input orientation. You might be wondering why there are two columns with F and FD. The reason is that, uh, that in this uh, Sheng's tutorial, Sheng has uh, solved the efficiency score uh, using two equivalent uh, linear programming formulation, uh, which are called primal formulation and the dual formulation. And uh, this uh, R code produces both results. And as you can see, both the primal formulation and the dual formulation, they yield exactly the same efficiency score. So they are completely equivalent ways of calculating the efficiency score. So if we look at them, if you consider the efficiency scores of all firms in this sample, we can calculate the average and standard deviation. So the average efficiency is 80% uh, and standard deviation almost 12%. So that would suggest that there is uh, there is considerable considerable efficiency improvement potential in this uh, in this sample, but also relatively large variation across different different firms. Besides those efficiency scores, I already emphasized that uh, there is also two types of weights that can be of interest. And firstly, let us consider this multiplier weights uh, gamma. So those are obtained as the optimal solution to the, to the primal linear programming formulation. So these uh, eight rows in this table on the slide, they refer again to the same eight, eight companies that we had in the example on the, on the previous slides. And here the columns V1, V2, and V3 uh, they don't refer now to this uh, noise term, but rather they are the weights of the, of the output variables. There is, of course, also the, the input variable, but for simplicity, I have now omitted this uh, input weight because we have just a single input. So this uh, input weight would be just one divided by the input variable by construction. So that doesn't really give us any, any information in this particular application. So let us focus on these output weights. And as you can see, the output weights are very, very small numbers in, in all cases. And this is because the outputs themselves are relatively large numbers. So the scaling is just, uh, just uh, um, arises from the fact that our, our data are measured in such large units. It would be, of course, possible to normalize the output variables or normalize the, the the weights to, to make them more easy, easy to interpret. But for our purposes, the, these weights are also, also okay. Just, uh, just don't worry about this uh, fact that they are very small numbers. Anyway, if they are non-zero, they, they play a role in the, in the DEA optimal solution. So before going to this uh, unit-specific weights more in more detail, it's maybe helpful to draw a comparison to, to classic linear regression. So we could, of course, uh, just use linear regression analysis and, uh, and uh, take the total cost as the dependent variable and explain it by these three output variables. So if you would run such a regression, of course, you would get uh, uh, this um, multiplier coefficients would be the same. There would be just one set of multipliers and they are applied to every, every firm. If you think about the usual regression output, there is just one set of coefficients. And this is the key difference to data envelopment analysis uh, because DEA solves this, uh, uh, DEA problem formulation is solved for, for each, out, each, each firm under evaluation separately. And that also generates us uh, uh, firm specific uh, output coefficients. So firm specific uh, multipliers. And you can see that these multipliers differ considerably 
from one firm to another. And this is big difference to the linear regression where you would only have the one common set of multipliers for all firms. So I have in this table also indicated uh, the output variable that, that yields the highest value of the multiplier weight by the red color rectangle. So notice that uh, for most of the firms, it is the output number one, which was the uh, electricity supply that gets the highest weight. But there are uh, firm number two and firm number three that actually assign zero. So perfectly 0, 0.00 for the first output variable. And those firms actually put the highest weight to the second output variable, which was the, the length of network. So this ill ind indicates this uh, uh, fact that in DEA, we are actually evaluating each, each evaluated firm uh, using the weights that uh, uh, indicate the performance in the most favorable light to the evaluated firm. So, so DEA allows a great flexibility in terms of these uh, multiplier weights. So in some sense, every, every, every firm in this sample would be allowed to freely choose which kind of weights would, would uh, uh, maximize the efficiency score when, when compared to the other firms. So for example, the second and the third firm are not doing so, so are not so competitive in terms of the supply of electricity. So to evaluate those firms, it is advantageous to set the weight of, uh, of electricity supply, the first output variable equal to zero and only evaluate performance in terms of the outputs number two and three. So this is a common feature in DEA. Notice also that uh, uh, the fourth and fifth and the seventh unit also similarly set uh, uh, the third output variable, the multiplier weight of the third output variable equal to zero. So for those companies, the third output variable, which is the number of customers, doesn't play a role in the, in the evaluation. So this is uh, known in the literature also as the benefit of the doubt principle, so that we, we evaluate the uh, performance using the weights that are most favorable to the evaluated unit. And that implies also that uh, some of the multiplier weights can be equal to zero. And that indicates if, if we have the such kind of zero values in the multiplier weights, it just indicates that uh, the evaluated unit is not very competitive in terms of that, that particular output variable compared to the other, other units in the sample. And it is perfectly possible that the DEA would assign all the weight to just one of the output variable. But there always has to be one output variable at least and one output variable, or sorry, one input variable that get the positive weight in every, every situation. Uh, perhaps it's good to mention also that if this is considered a problem that, uh, that there are zero weights, it is also possible to uh, impose some additional weight restrictions to force that these output weights must be, must be positive and, and uh, uh, greater than certain minimum threshold. And it's possible to have either, either absolute bounds for the weights or some relative bounds that, for example, the relative weight of... Uh, output number two cannot be more than three times higher than the relative weight of uh, output number three, for example, just to illustrate the concept. So in my view, these multiplier weights are extremely interesting. We can think about them as a, as a shadow prices of these outputs. And we also, also look into this kind of shadow pricing interpretation uh, later in this course. So it's not only the efficiency scores, but also the multiplier weights can be interesting. And these were obtained as the optimal solution to the uh, primal linear programming problem to solve the DEA efficiency. So remember, I also indicated that, that there is also the equivalent dual formulation. So there were this uh, F and FD efficiency scores. So if we solve the equivalent dual formulation, we get another set of weights. And these weights I will refer to as the intensity weights. And I will, I will uh, indicate them by the Greek letter lambda. So 
those uh, multiply weights uh, were used for the output variables, but intensity weights are weights assigned to the to the units in the sample. So the idea with this uh, these intensity weights is to compare the performance of the evaluated unit against some linear combination of other units in the sample. And it is linear combination, particularly in this constant returns to scale specification. And uh, when solving this, uh, this uh, dual formulation in constant returns to scale, we find that there are eight companies that get efficiency score exactly equal to 100%. So they are efficient, fully efficient firms. And here I have indicated in the, on this uh, second row that uh, this identity of those eight companies. So company number 22, number 28, 32, 37, 46, 56, 70, and 73. Those particular companies are efficient companies according to the DEA assessment. We do not need to specify those in advance. So DEA identifies those efficient units automatically. Okay. And the idea here is that uh, those eight companies could then serve as some kind of role models for those inefficient units. And, and the term that we use is, is benchmark. So for the benchmarking purposes, it's already uh, an interesting result to identify that these eight, eight companies are the role models for other, other units. And how the efficiency scores are then calculated we will take uh, linear combinations of those uh, those eight benchmarks. So in the table on this slide, I have again considered this example of eight eight units that are the first ones in the list. So the the eight rows with these numbers are the eight first uh, electricity distribution firms in the sample. And then those columns L22, L28, and so on they refer to these 100% uh, efficient units used as the benchmark. And uh, the numbers then indicate uh, this uh, with, uh, with the numbers with five decimal digits, they indicate the weights of those uh, benchmark units. So for example, think about the first uh, electricity distribution firm in the sample. So remember, it had efficiency score was less than one, so the first unit is inefficient according to DEA and uh, the efficiency score is calculated by comparing the performance of the first unit uh, against the linear combination of other units. And this linear combination is obtained as the combination of uh, uh, unit number 22. We see that this, there is positive weight 0 0.01987 assigned to this uh, firm number 22, there is also a positive weight to the firm number 32, and then biggest weight is actually assigned to the firm number 70. So firm number 70 gets the weight of 0 0.20775. So that was read on the first, uh, first row. And uh, notice that by using these linear combinations, uh, the weights of these benchmark units do not have to sum to one. All the weights have to be positive or, 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 or at least non-negative, but they do not have to sum to one. When, when this uh, sum of the weights is less than one, it actually means that we are scaling down some of these bigger electricity distribution units to, to form the benchmark. But also scaling up is possible. So let's consider the fourth electricity distribution firm in the sample. So look at the fourth row in this table. So uh, there are of course a lot of zeros, but uh, then a large weight is assigned to the unit number 37. So unit number 37 on the fourth row gets the weight of 2.4. So the weight can be even greater than one. It can be, it can be anything. So this would indicate that this unit number 37 is, is um, scale up upwards so it's expanded by factor 2.4 to form the benchmark for the for the fourth unit so in the constant returns to scale specification 
we can take these efficient firms and we can also also scale them upwards or downwards to obtain the benchmarks for the for the for the inefficient units and again DEA is automatically identifying these efficient benchmarks and also also this uh, relative weights of the benchmarks for each evaluated unit so in the constant returns to scale case uh, we have that uh, that the weights do not have to sum to one but there is also the alternative uh, variable returns to scale specification and uh, for comparison i have also uh, calculated the efficiency scores using the variable returns to scale specification and here is the comparison for the for the first eight units so the variable returns to scale is abbreviated as VRS and constant returns to scale was CRS and uh, if you compare the efficiency scores then notice that uh, they are rather similar both in CRS and VRS but uh, but this variable returns to scale VRS on the right hand side it gives always a slightly higher efficiency score than the CRS and this is the general property of the of the DEA so the variable returns to scale efficiency score is always at least as high or or greater than than uh, the CRS efficiency score we will see it later later in this course why why that is the case but that that you can already see from the empirical results also if we go to the intensity weights using the variable returns to scale then we observe that uh, allowing for the variable returns to scale then the number of 100 uh, percent efficient units these efficient peers that expands by three additional units so also units number 12 and 15 and 61 which i have indicated with red color in the list so three additional units are also becoming 100 percent efficient in the variable returns to scale and they are also can be serving as the benchmarks for others i have also reproduced this uh, uh, intensity weights lambda for the first eight units here so now there are these additional columns for, for number 12, 15, and uh, 61. And uh, notice that now if you if you sum, if you take the sum of weights for each row, then the sum of weights must be equal to one for each evaluated unit. So for example, if you take the first unit, now uh, the intensity weights lambda are positive uh, for unit number 61, which gets 81% uh, of weight, and then we have uh, number 70, which gets 17% of weight. And then there's also small weight assigned to unit number 37, which gets 1.7% uh, weight. And uh, if we sum all of these together, then uh, we, will get, uh, we will get the, uh, that the sum, sum is equal to one. So now this implies that there cannot be any units that would be given a weight greater than one and, and all of the units have to get, the sum of all the weights has to be one. So this means in the variable returns to scale, uh, we have to use convex combinations rather than linear combinations of the, of the benchmarks. So that means that this kind of uh, scaling of the units uh, beyond their own, own uh, a size is not possible upwards and it's also not possible to scale down downwards so so the scale has to be uh, exactly same as that of the, of the of the evaluated unit but this becomes more clear when we look at the mathematical programming formulation so let me summarize a couple of uh, basic properties of the of the DEA that you might have already noticed so firstly, I already pointed out that uh, that uh, efficiency score in the variable returns to scale specification is always greater than or equal to that in the constant returns to scale specification. That always happens if you calculate the efficiency scores correctly. Or if you have a, if you obtain some other result, then there's some kind of kind of error. 
Another property is that if, if some, some unit is 100% efficient under constant returns to scale specification, then it must be also 100% efficient in the variable returns to scale specification. However, the reverse is not true. So, so any unit that is efficient in the variable returns to scale specification does not have to be efficient in the constant returns to scale, but at least some of them have to be efficient. So this also Ill indicates that uh, it might be interesting to compare the variable returns to scale and constant returns to scale efficiency scores. And uh, this is indeed possible. And uh, uh, in fact, there is the concept of scale efficiency, which is simply obtained as the, as the ratio of the efficiency score obtained as the constant returns to scale and with the variable returns to scale. So CRS efficiency divided by VRS efficiency indicates the scale efficiency. I haven't really talked about the input orientation and the output orientation so much in this lecture, but we come back to that a little bit later. Uh, I want to point out only that, uh, that if we apply constant returns to scale, then this choice of the orientation doesn't really matter because the input oriented efficiency score is simply one divided by the output oriented efficiency score under the constant returns to scale specification. However, in the variable returns to scale case, this is not necessary case. So the input orientation and the output orientation can yield a different result. So let me conclude this, uh, this uh, first lecture by comparing the advantages and disadvantages of, of DEA. So I believe this uh, example already illustrates that uh, DEA is, is very much a data-driven approach. It doesn't really require any kind of uh, parametric assumptions about the functional form of the frontier or any kind of distributional assumptions about the distribution of the inefficiency. So that is one of the greatest advantages of DEA to let the data speak for themselves. It doesn't imply that DEA is free of assumptions. In fact, DEA needs to make a great deal of assumptions, uh, but uh, most of the assumptions uh, have actually very strong axiomatic foundation, as we see when we look at to the, to the production theory. So we get back to this point in, the, in more detail. But uh, in the context of the regulation of electricity distribution firms, I would say a positive uh, feature of DEA is that uh, it imposes this kind of properties such as monotonicity and convexity for the output isoquants. So for example, you notice that all of these output weights were non-negative. There would be not possibility to have some negative weight for the output variables. And indeed, a negative value for the output variables would be kind of problematic in the incentive regulation because it would actually give a strong incentive for the, that company to, to produce less rather than more. So in that sense, the DEA benchmarks are very well behaved in the sense that it doesn't give this kind of uh, weird incentives to, to benefit from producing less rather than more. Um, perhaps it also, the example illustrates how simple to use DEA is. You simply upload the data to the software, whatever software you might be using. You press the button and voila, you have the efficiency scores. So this kind of uh, seducive simplicity is certainly one reason for the great popularity of DEA. But uh, I'm a little bit uh, hesitating to put this clearly as an advantage. It might be also a disadvantage because uh, uh, the fact that you can just uh, upload data, press the button and get efficiency scores, it can also lead to a lot of stupid applications of DEA. Uh, in, my, in my impression, DEA has also gained a lot of bad reputation with this kind of naive applications where, where DEA is actually not really, really a useful approach. So the simplicity can be also uh, also advantage or but also a disadvantage that uh, depending on the on the application and I would really urge the users to carefully look at the multiplier weights and intensity weights to see do these weights make sense because if the weights are weights are not uh, not uh, intuitive then perhaps the efficiency scores are not either so this leads me to the to the disadvantages the illustrative example also demonstrated that uh, 
In many cases, we have zero weights, both for the multiplier weights and for the intensity weights, but particularly for the multiplier weights, so there's a lot of zeros. And uh, the intensity weights indicate that, that there is uh, only a handful of uh, efficient units that actually determine the frontier. So again, in the CRS case, there were eight efficient units in the variable returns to scale 11. So only those units are influential to determine the frontier. All other firms in the sample do not matter at all for the efficient frontier. So already uh, Michael Farrell in his seminar paper from 1957 observed this fact and, uh, and he referred to it in the words as a great waste of information. And from the perspective of econometrician, this appears quite a, quite a waste of information that, 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 that such a large proportion of your data doesn't actually matter for the frontier at all. Perhaps even bigger issue is that um, if your data are not so perfect that you have captured all of your uh, all potential sources of uh, heterogeneity in the firms and their op operating environments, uh, uh, maybe there are some omitted factors, maybe there are some data errors, maybe you cannot measure those variables so perfectly as you would hope for. So any of this kind of, uh, kind of deviations will be attributed to the, to the inefficiency component. And this relates to the observation I made already at the beginning that we had, had to cancel out this noise term that could actually capture some of this kind of heterogeneity and omitted factors. So this makes DEA very sensitive to noise. It, noise can be, of course, in the evaluated unit, but can be also in those benchmarks. And especially it's a bigger problem if it is uh, present in those benchmarks, because then it affects all of the, uh, all of the efficiency scores. Also, as the remedy to this kind of unobserved heterogeneity and omitted factors, of course, you might consider increasing the number of uh, input and output variables used in the application. Uh, so obviously, if you increase the number of input and output variables, a larger proportion of your, of your sample will, will uh, look and appear as efficient. But then there is also the, the cost that this, this can be just uh, uh, sort of seemingly efficient. And uh, there is the statistical term, the curse of dimensionality, which is uh, a very severe issue in the case of DEA. So it's also not, a, not really a good recommendation to increase the number of input and output variables in the DEA application, because then, then uh, a large proportion of units would look as efficient, but, but uh, they might not be efficient in reality, because then also you would get a lot of, lot of zero values in your, in your multiplier weights, and, uh, and uh, it can be also a problem of, of its own. So there is not really also such an easy, easy solution to this uh, uh, heterogeneity and uh, omitted factors issue, the issue number two. And, uh, and uh, if, if we would try to solve it by increasing the number of input and output variables, then we would also have to somehow deal with the curse of dimensionality. But uh, all of this uh, we come back to a little bit later in this, in this uh, more theoretical uh, lectures, so I want to make this kind of um, discussion of disadvantages at this stage to also motivate you to look into the black box of DEA more carefully. So in the le next lecture, I start then going to this uh, linear programming formulations of DEA to get an idea of how DEA is actually calculating these efficiency scores and perhaps also more importantly gain a little bit more insight to this multiplier and intensity weights that DEA is pro producing as sort of a side product of, of calculating those efficiency scores.